Uh, thank you very much for joining us here tonight for the IEA Book Club. My name is Matthew Lash and I'm the Head of Public Policy here at the IEA. Um, I'm very excited to, to be joined by our special guest, um, Sir Howard Davies, here tonight. Uh, before we get to that, though, I'm just going to go through a few quick pieces of housekeeping. So we're going to be um, uh, in discussion for about 20 to 25 minutes, um, and then we'll open up to questions uh, from our in-person audience. Um, the event, both the discussion and the Q&A, will be recorded and released on the IEA's YouTube channel. Uh, please do turn your mobile phones to silent. Um, and if you're looking for the ladies' laboratories, uh, they're outside uh, to the left and down the stairs, while the gentlemen's are uh, outside to the left through the courtyard and, and on the other side over around here. Uh, and with that out of the way, I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker. Tonight, the IEA Book Club's uh, very delighted to be joined by Sir Howard Davies, a British economist and author and chairman of the NatWest Group. He's the former director of the London School of Economics, first chairman of the Financial Services Authority, former chairman of Phoenix Group, the UK Airports Commission, a former deputy governor of the Bank of England and a treasury official. Um, I don't know if there's any positions you haven't held, but... Uh, uh, well, if, Director <laughs> General of the CBI was one that you missed uh, out. Another one, indeed, yeah. indeed, I've forgotten. Well, some think that's important, others don't, but... Anyway. Uh, I mean, well, we, can come, we can come to that. <laughs> um, uh, look, as, uh, as an author as well, Sir Howard has written on various economic topics, including the global financial regulation, the financial crisis, and most notably, the Chancellor's. Um, he's, this is the, the second in a series of books. The first one was released in 2006. Um, and this is uh, the Chancellor's Steering the British Economy in a Crisis Times. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for the invitation. Um, to start, what led you to this topic, I guess, both in mm. the first place for your first book and, and why you wanted to come back to it? Well, the first book was uh, somewhat opportunistic and um, d arose from the fact that I was uh, director of the London School of Economics, which... Um, uh, and you know there are a lot of political science and economics students who were interested in steering the British economy. And um, I had the idea of asking all the then extant chancellors. And one of the things about chancellors is they do seem to live quite a long time, <laughs> uh, a bit like a bit like conductors who seem to go on forever. Um, and it turned out that the chancellors going back to Dennis Healy in '74 were all around and all perfectly compost mentis. <laughs> um, and so I asked them to come to the school to lecture and uh, dinner afterwards and that kind of thing, and to talk really about how it was to run the Treasury. I mean, not to sort of rerun every political and economic argument they'd had, but how they found the Treasury, whether they came with any pre-cooked economic ideas, you know, how they found the quality of the officials, you know, that sort of, just to give a feeling to people. And, and I, I'm quite uh, an, an in favour in favor of, of a degree of oral history. You know, I think we sort of miss um, the record of what people think. So anyway, they all came, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Dennis Healy and Ken Clark, who were the bookends um, of this, just basically both rambled charmingly and amusingly, but <laughs> not anything particularly. And, you know, more typically, Geoffrey Howe came with a very carefully prepared <laughs> paper, you know, uh, and uh, with references. Um, and uh, Nigel Lawson did actually something similar. Norman Lamont, a little bit in between. But anyway, I put, assembled them into a book with what then turned into quite a long introduction, which did pull out the themes through that period. So that was from 74... Uh, to 97 um, and you know that was a fairly sort of coherent period if you like which led up to Bank of England independence so it was a period in which the country had been wrestling with how to find an anchor for monetary policy effectively you know tried various monetary aggregate the targets tried uh, you know, a whole variety, had the Ken and Eddie show and all that kind of thing, and then eventually ended up at Bank of England Independence, and that seemed to be a, a kind of good uh, end point. And then it was just at the beginning of COVID um, that um, I thought, well, I wonder if I could do something similar, um, because it was you know, more or less 25 years on from 97. Obviously, in COVID, you couldn't get the chancellors to all come and deliver lectures. It wasn't anywhere for them to do that. But it turned out that 
uh, I had a bit of time to spare, and so did they, uh, and were quite happy to talk, as indeed were quite a lot of officials. So I decided it was slightly different, so it was based on interviews, um, but uh, as you've seen, it, it's, not, it's not just, I mean, there's quite a lot of quotes in it, but it's not just a whole, you know, one interview. I've tried to weave it together into, in, and tell a story. And um, you know, it seemed to hang together again reasonably well, going from, uh, from uh, Gordon Brown through Darling uh, Osborne um, and then Hammond and uh, Sunak. Uh, of course, I didn't expect that there'd be two more before <laughs> the ink was dry <laughs> on the book, but that's just... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was about to say, thank goodness there were more chancellors, because then we get uh, more, more volumes of the book, and well, it, it's yeah. going to keep you if in business. If I do half a dozen each time, I'll be doing another one by next spring, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought, uh, one of your interesting remarks on the book, which, which has perhaps even changed, um, is this, uh, the fact that chancellors are normally quite long-lived, but I don't think that's been the case no. as much recently. But kind of getting to some of the themes of the book, one of the kind of continuing themes is, is, is kind, of a, a kind of existential questions about the, the role of the, the Treasury, its power, its influence, its perception. And, and you, throughout the book, you, you go through um, that in a few different ways um, in terms of its changing responsibilities and, and respect. I, I, I want to kind of, in a, I suppose, a broad reflection before we get into some of the more specific questions here. Do you think the Treasury is in a strong position today as it was in 1997? Well, um, up until last week, I would have said yes. <laughs> now, I just don't know at this point, and I don't think anybody else does, how to interpret this decapitation of the Treasury and whether that's going to result in any sort of structural change or whether it's just a personal thing. I just do not know. But I would have said up until then that the Treasury had retained its status. Now, there were two things that happened during the period which you might have thought would have affected the Treasury's status, if you like. One was, of course, Bank of England independence. But the Treasury never really saw that as a major attack on it, because I think the Treasury had come to the view, and actually successive chancellors had come to the view, but certainly officials had, that holding the interest rate weapon in the Treasury was not a great place for it to be, because you might think that you could exercise it but actually the politics always got in the way. And I tell you in, in, that, in the book, because when I was in the Ken and Eddie show, because Ken and, uh, were, you know, had on one side of the table and Eddie George and I as his deputy, and it was only one deputy at the time, on the other side. And I vividly remembered when we went in once and the bank had carefully, you know, the bank overcooks things, if anything, Tim will know this, you know, that bank briefing just goes on and on and on and meetings for, you know, weeks. And the bank had finally brought itself to the point of saying that interest rates ought to rise by a quarter of a percent. And we walked in having presented this massive paper and Eddie was about to speak and Ken said, well, it's obviously we aren't moving this week, are we? Um, so what should we talk about? because he was concerned that if we walked in and then walked straight out, there were press outside who counted how long the meeting was. Um, and if it was very long, it, lo it looked like a row. If it was very short, uh, it looked as if we'd been dismissed. So we sat around for half an hour talking about rugby and, you know, um, before we were allowed to go, having been dismissed right in the first sentence. And so the Treasury had come to the view that actually having this power was not particularly useful because it was... You know, it was very difficult to exercise with politicians and elections coming up and that kind of thing. So the, I don't think the Treasury saw that as a loss, really, of significant power. And indeed, I don't think the rest of the world has seen it that way. Then the second change, which was structural, was the arrival of the Office of Budget Responsibility, which was George Osborne's idea. And once again, I think the Treasury found that that was actually helpful to it because it was much more difficult for the Chancellor to fiddle the forecasts. Not, of course, that any Chancellor I would accuse personally of having fiddled the forecast, but there was a bit of a tradition of, you know, the Treasury putting up saying, if you do this, then this is the likely outcome. And Chancellor say, oh, surely it won't be as bad as that. You know? <laughs> and, of course, they ultimately signed off on it. Whereas when the OBR does it, it's a different thing. But actually, again, the Treasury found that in the end, although it looked like the Treasury forecasters being hived off, they were actually more useful outside than they were inside, and similarly with monetary policy control. 
So those two things I don't think affected the Treasury's authority at all, indeed possibly even enhanced it. And then if you look during the period, there were several attempts to cut the Treasury down to size, many of them and that harking back to the old Department of Economic Affairs under um, George Brown, if you remember, in the 1960s with, Dennis, with Harold Wilson. And um, the Tony Blair, because he got sick of Gordon, wanted to uh, cut the Treasury down to size, and there was something called Project Teddy Bear, run by John Burt, weirdly, um, which had a sort of idea of kind of an office of management and budget, and, uh, and, a, and a finance ministry, if you like. Um, and then the uh, Theresa May's um, uh, officials, particularly um, uh, Fiona Hall, Hill, Hill, Hill and uh, Nick, Hill, Nick Timothy, and, and yeah. Nick, uh, uh, yeah, Nick, Nick Timothy, they both had plans to uh, do it uh, as well. In fact, even Gordon did at one point. He wanted to kick out Nick McPherson and somehow change the Treasury around. And that all of these things had sort of failed and then indeed uh, Boris Cummings Johnson well, yeah. tried to um, you know when he when Sajid Javid was uh, refused the job if you like because he was told that all his advisors would have to be run in number 10 and the, at that point again it seemed like the treasury was sort of losing authority but if you look through the the time the period every time there's a crisis it turns out that a rather powerful treasury is quite handy and it was extremely handy um, in the financial crisis. It was extremely handy in the Scottish referendum. We might come on to that. Mm. And then under COVID. And so my impression was that Boris Johnson switched within about two weeks from being kind of grumpy about the bloody treasury and, as he used to say, you know, to all these people, anyone who wants to hear, to discovering that the treasury was the only thing that could save him by devising, you know, quick schemes that actually worked now, there'll be people who argue about fraud afterwards, but, you know, fundamentally, the Treasury schemes work. So until that point, I would have said the Treasury was as, uh, had as, strong, as much authority as at any time in the period. But, you know, we now appear to have a slightly different environment, and we'll see. But we might know at the end of the week. <laughs> I'm going to come back to that uh, idea mm. about the Treasury orthodoxy in just a moment. But before that... I'm kind of thinking about the history of it, and I'm interested in the, the role of the Treasury as a, as a political actor. And I think you highlight three um, main events during this period where the, the Treasury and, and had a, a very clearly stated view. I think we've got the question of joining the euro, the tests. Um, we've got the Scottish rec referendum and, and Brexit. Now, you could, you could potentially say that the Treasury view won two out of three times there mm. um, was broadly success. But I'm interested in, in the kind of justification for the idea that the Treasury should even have a view. Um, is, is the Treasury too much of a political actor at times? Does that undermine its, um, its, its ability? Should there really be this kind yes. of knowledge that we have an idea that there, there is such thing as a Treasury view? Should the Treasury not necessarily, I suppose, in a Westminster system with a minister on top, it's the, it's the minister's view who decides and uh, their, their role is to advise and do as they're Well, I, I think that in, in each case this was uh, ministers actually, but um, I do think that in the case of the Euro um, and in the case of the Scottish referendum, there was a completely legitimate reason why the Treasury, and this was Treasury officials actually, uh, in both cases, um, the, you know, the papers were written by groups of officials. I think it was totally reasonable for a government to say, we want your advice on this proposition. You know, how does, how would joining the euro affect the UK economy? I think that's a perfectly reasonable question. And even Blair, who was maddened by the way the five tests turned out, he didn't contest the fact that that work should be done. And, you know, he always reserved the view that well, we may want to say, well, OK, this would be a disaster economically, but we're going to do it anyway because we think in the political long term it's the right thing to do. Um, and so he, he kind of did, you know, he did establish a distinction, I think, between the type of work. So I think that was totally legit. And I also think that what they did in the Scottish referendum was legitimate. Now, there are people who don't think so. I mean, I talked to officials and some thought that Nick McPherson, who put, put his name to a published paper on the subject, went too far. And some Treasury officials said that they thought this was a mistake. Nick would argue 
strenuously, and I have to say I think he convinced me, that this was such a fundamental issue, the issue of the currency. You know, he wasn't writing a paper saying the Scots shouldn't be able to determine their own affairs. What he was writing a paper saying, the Scots can't have a totally independent fiscal policy and our currency. Because it just doesn't work. And I think that was a perfectly legitimate question to ask officials to give a view on. And when you finally one, when you get to the European referendum, I would say it divides into two. The first paper the Treasury produced on the economic impact of Brexit actually has stood the test of time reasonably well. And absent a few people, uh, are, 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 I would describe as a slightly further shores of e economics, most people accept that there has been a, a GDP penalty of Brexit. Now they may say it's worth it for the long run, and that's a perfectly legitimate point of view to, to hold. But the Treasury's estimates of the GDP, the trade impact and the GDP impact that were published in about March 2016 look quite good if you look at it now and if you look at what's happened since then. The paper that was published right before the referendum, which essentially George Osborne wrote himself, um, was uh, completely different and said, you know, that, that huge snakes will roam the countryside. <laughs> Uh, and immediate recession Brexit, and immediate mass recession, job losses and, and we'll have to have an emergency budget shoving up taxes. This will cost thirty billion. Yeah, and the NHS will lose money. All that and, stuff. Yeah, yeah. and the treasury, if you ask treasury officials about it, that was the one thing where I found that I mean, mostly treasury officials are fairly good at answering questions and they're reasonably open. But um, I asked quite a number of people. But I said, you know, did all, did George Osborne really go home with you know a a, pa a pad of paper and a pen and write this and they well no perhaps not I said well who, well, who did write it and they all go well it was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, nobody will accept that they actually wrote this wretched paper but I think that one was I can't find a way of defending that yeah I mean I think on, on the first paper there, there'd be some questions by people who are more I suppose more sympathetic to the, the Brexit economic case about whether or not you can really determine the impact of Brexit considering Covid um, whether or not there is a, a short-term loss of Brexit, but a, a big regulatory opportunity or a, um, trade opportunities that haven't yet been realised, and therefore it, it might have overrated the long-term costs of, of Brexit Maybe. as well. They haven't been realised yet, and they look, yeah. they look to be uh, uh, retreating as we approach them. But <laughs> then, OK, that's just a point of view. Yeah. Um, on the, the Treasury orthodoxy point, which is something um, also referred to as the Treasury yes. view in, in your book, um, yes. I'm wondering if you could tell us what you think that is. What is the Treasury view? Well, there, there was uh, an interesting uh, speech by Nick McPherson, who's the one permanent secretary who has said more in, in public about the way the Treasury thinks. And he tried to capture the Treasury view. And essentially, he says that it consists of not really that much, actually, uh, and that this notion of fiscal orthodoxy, I think, needs to be unpicked slightly. But he believes the Treasury view is essentially in favour of free trade. I mean, all other things being equal, you know, but I mean, generally. Secondly, in favour of enhancing competition, because they believe that, you know, that's the route to, to productivity growth. To the third point he would identify is, if you like, non-distortionary taxation um, by which he means not being too clever with the tax system <laughs> you know <laughs> the, a tax system that is simple and predictable and not with lots of clever wheezes designed to promote particular places or particular activities etc and then fiscal sustainability now you know I think that the record shows that the Treasury has been pretty flexible in the way it's interpreted fiscal sustainability over time, but they certainly think that you need to present a plausible course of the future of the British economy which does not lead to escalating public debt. I think that would be a characteristic of the Treasury view. Mm. So, uh, obviously, as you uh, mentioned earlier, the, the government has come under heavy criticism for the sacking of um, Tom Scholar, who is the, the permanent secretary of uh, the, the Treasury. Um, I think, the, in my mind at least, there's, there's two ways in which the orthodoxy has been, I think, clearly articulated in terms of criticism. As the first one would be this idea that the Treasury is too penny-pinching, it's, it's, it sees 
you know, short-term revenue as a, as a higher priority than economic growth and therefore has been pushing too high taxes on necessarily well-designed taxes. And then secondarily to that, that inter obviously related as well, is the Treasury isn't putting forward policies for economic growth. Um, that, that the Treasury has, has failed in its mission um, to secure economic growth for mm. the country. Do you think there's, there's much legitimacy to those kind of criticisms? No. Um, <laughs> uh, it's so on the would you amplify at all? I mean, I can understand. I can understand. I mean, I actually, my criticism of the Treasury would be, would be slightly different. I think one criticism I would have of the Treasury, which is relevant to this, is I think the Treasury does like control at the centre of public finances to probably more detailed a level. The Treasury is fundamentally anti-localist, <laughs> you know, because they don't trust anybody else to control, to deliver fiscal sustainability. So I certainly think that if you developed a critique of, you know, the, the, the Treasury's reluctance on any kind of devolution of power and devolution of tax authority, etc., I think that's quite a strong criticism of the Treasury, in, in my view. Um, as for whether the Treasury is too sort of penny-pinching short-term versus long-term growth, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't see much evidence of it. I mean, it is true that the Treasury is the one department that doesn't define itself as a spending department. You know? And so if you're in the Treasury, uh, as I was for some time, you know, you, you do start to think the whole of the world is against you because every other minister and every other department defines his or her success or failure by how they spend money. You know, nobody else is raising any money. They are only spending it. And so the Treasury does get itself into the psychology of a kind of bank that likes to say no. Um, and I, I don't think you can dismiss that. But then you have to say, what's the alternative to that? You know, what is the alternative to having somebody? And, and I think it's, you know, anyone in a company knows that, unless they're extremely unusual, the most unpopular person in the company is the finance director. <laughs> and if you're the chairman, that's just what you want. You know, I don't want my finance director to be ready to give anything, you know, any bit of marketing expenditure to anyone who comes along and asks for it. They're, they're kind of structurally, that's the role that they are bound to have. It's the bad cop role, effectively, yeah. yeah. I mean, I also think there's probably a strong argument that it's, it's very easy to blame the, the Treasury for a failure of ministers. You know, something like um, housing and planning policy that holds back economic yes. growth. That's, that's not necessarily the fault of the Treasury, who I'm, 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 yes. if they had a view, I'm sure would be favourable to reform. But something you do highlight, you highlight a few kind of interesting quotes about... I suppose an instance of kind of conservatism or uh, maybe even um, lack of kind of reforming focus of the, of the Treasury. So you, you quote um, Edward Troop, who talks about lack of knowledge and understanding about tax. Yes. You quote uh, Nick McPherson at one point, who says it's politicians, you come up with radical ideas, while Treasury tends to come up with lots of reasons not to do them. There have been some proposals that perhaps the, the role of the Treasury should be split. And, and you mentioned this earlier, between the, the finance and the economics ministry, as is quite common in a lot of other countries. Do you think that could potentially, I, I suppose, might be seen as a big um, weakening of tr the Treasury's power, but could it lead to better policy? Mm. Yeah, on, on those, the points you make, uh, yes, I, I do think another uh, weakness of the Treasury has been on tax policy. Now, they would say, well, you know, ministers have made it more difficult, and, you know, I quote some rather amusing numbers about how George Osborne came <laughs> to power with a commitment to reduce the size of the Tolly's tax handbook. You know, from uh, and it went up uh, like hundreds way. of yeah, pages yeah, yeah. every year uh, as a result of his sort of tinkering with stuff. Um, but but it, it is true that the Treasury shows remarkably little interest in promoting fundamental uh, tax reform. There was a Merley's report, which is still worth reading actually, about the British tax system, but where you know and the Treasury just sort of showed no real interest. In it, um, and so I do think that's a fairly strong and cogent uh, criticism. As for the division of the Treasury, I've got to say that when I began to write this book, I thought that I would probably conclude that a split in the Treasury made sense. Um, and you know, I'm quite familiar with the uh, 
the French uh, system and the German system, and they do have a Ministry of Economy and a Ministry of Finance. Um, and I changed my mind uh, in the course of writing the book uh, for a couple of reasons. One, as a, a conversation I had with Gus O'Donnell, who said, Howard, he said, where do all the ideas about splitting the Treasury come from? And I thought about it for a bit, and I thought, well, actually, they all come from 10 Downing Street. That's where they've all come from. And he said, well, you know, does that not cause you to sort of wonder why, what their motive is? And that, um, you know, his motive is someone who'd been the Cabinet Secretary as well, said that in our system, a Prime Minister with a strong majority in Parliament can be something of an elective dictator and can, in principle, do what they like. And that a countervailing power in the Treasury of a, an, a department that does have an overview of spending and the economy uh, is a valuable counterweight in our system. Um, and I think that's probably true. And in other countries, in Germany and in France, with degrees of proportionality, but also a president and a prime minister, and all, there, there is more uh, distribution of power and responsibility. So I came to the conclusion that I didn't think the division made sense. Then there's the issue about a sort of growth strategy. In my view, the strongest criticism you can mount of the lack of an economic growth strategy in this country should be directed at the business department. And it, whether it was the DTI or Bayes or whatever, the fact that it keeps being called something different is in itself of interest. And I think that they have failed miserably. I think that department is the problem. And I think there's a degree of transference onto the Treasury of the lack of any kind of industrial strategy. And I have you know, felt uh, this myself, and I was in the Treasury at one, one of the jobs I had there for three years was uh, overseeing the aerospace industry, you know, both civil and military. And essentially, the DTI would, you know, was just in favour of bailing out existing companies, essentially. Um, and, you know, there was no sense that they had a strategic view of what our aerospace industry should be. They just came along wringing their hands and saying, we've got to give Rolls-Royce another 500 million to, you know, for launch aid for some new engine. And you say, well, which plane is it going to go on? And what's the forecast? Well, they, don't do that. they were just, you know, they were bailout people, really. And so I do think it's the absence of any sort of strategic thinking in the business department that is as, as much what people are on about in this country, about the lack of a clear strategy. Yeah, I mean, the idea of giving um, Bayes responsibility for uh, growth policy, uh, at least until recently, I guess, would send shivers down my spine on the basis that yeah. it, it doesn't have a particularly great record in terms of no, un understanding um, dynamic market economies. I do, I do notice, kind of, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, there's, there's talk of making it the MOG department, the, the Ministry for Growth. But it, it feels at the same time, it doesn't necessarily have the same level of, I suppose, power and uh, well, whose fault expertise. Well, fault is that? You tell me. Well, I mean, I just don't, you know, I think they've behaved, I mean, they've just done poorly. Now, you can say, OK, well, we abandoned them and then we attacked the Treasury. But then you're sort of breaking up the Treasury because of the failure of this thing over here. I just don't think, that makes, I just mm. don't think that's logical. So is it, is it then the solution clear responsibilities then? It, you say, you know, the, the Treasury isn't really responsible for growth, it's, it's Bayes. You know, it feels like the, the, if you ask someone which department is responsible for growth, their yeah. instinctive response is probably still the Treasury, isn't it? It's, it's, at least to, in my mind it is. Yes, but I think there is, you know, growth. I mean, just to come out and say we want to grow the economy by 2.5% more, great. But I mean, I don't know. You know, there's got to be something behind it. And I think, unfortunately, if you look at what's happened in the last few years, it's been absolutely all over the place. I mean, the government, the last government, set up an industrial strategy council run by chaired by Andy Haldane of the bank, who is, I think, as an imaginative a thinker as you could find. I don't always agree with him, but I mean, he's a restless intellect, Andy Haldane, has lots of ideas. Uh, and then that produced a, an industrial strategy document, which was then just locked away in a drawer. I mean, no one's ever seen high da, high, high hair of it. Uh, then the, the Prime Minister set up a new business Build Back Better Council, I think it was called. <laughs> well, what's happened to that? 
and then a British Business Council. You know, what's happened to that? This is child play. This is childish stuff. I mean, it's, they've got to sort of set a, you know, a coherent framework for deciding what kind of industrial strategy we want to have. And then, you know, the Treasury will, I think, be ready to get behind it if it makes some sense. But actually, it's just been, you know, window dressing all over the place. I mean, yeah. lab, Labour's not better. It was no better, I don't think. I mean, a, a libertarian perspective might be that you don't want a, a strategy per se. I mean, you want well, the government fine. to have policies, but um, you wouldn't... Well, necessarily... fine, but then don't, you know, but, but telling the Treasury it's got to achieve 2.5% growth implies something. Well, your, your strategy is to reform the tax system and cut regulations that, um, you yeah, know, are good. restricting infrastructure building and, and uh, mm. house building and whatever else. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the fantasy ideal world we, uh, yeah. we, we want to live in. Um, I might open up to, to questions from, from the audience. Now, that we have um, a microphone, but the microphone is only for uh, broadcast purposes, so it won't come through these speakers, but please do still speak into the microphone. Caught my eye first at the front lady. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think that's a really good point about strategy. And so who is responsible for strategy if it's not the government, if it's not various departments, um, if it's not the civil service, who should be responsible for strategy? Well, I think it has to be, you know, under uh, ministers because some, and you're, you're absolutely right to point to them, some of these things that would make sense in a, in a strategy. And let's take, let's take planning, which is kind of an, an obvious one. You know, it's no point in civil servants coming up and saying we ought to ref reform the planning regime. I mean, it's pure politics, the planning regime, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's got to have political impetus behind it. So I think you have to have um, some kind of uh, economic development council, probably chaired by the prime minister. There used to be one. I was on it for a bit. Uh, <laughs> the National Economic Development Council wasn't such a bad idea, frankly. Um, uh, but which isn't isn't about you know bailing out uh, dead and dying industries, but is about the the environment for growth. I mean, I was completely sympathetic to your general point that the government should be uh, you know should be setting the environment. Although I think it's not just the tax system. I mean, I think infrastructure spending is something which actually governments need to have a strategic view of themselves. You can't just sort of say, well, we'll reform Solvency too, and then infrastructure will be built everywhere. Because, you know, it's intimately linked with planning and everything else. So, I mean, it can't be just left to uh, the in, in institutions. So I think you do need um, some kind of economic development council, um, you know, which is a clearinghouse uh, for these ideas and which generates a bit of consensus. And one one problem I've got with the way think the way the rhetoric has been working very recently, it doesn't sound much like building consensus actually. And you know, in some of these things you have to bring some people along. You'll never reform the planning system uh, if you just tell everybody they're nimbies and beat them around the head. You know, I mean... It <laughs> Don't just... tell my colleague Kristen Nimitz that, he might have. <laughs> <laughs> it won't happen. You know, you have to build a consensus around why it makes sense and try to explain why these constraints on these forms of development are, are damaging the economy and why they're, you know, what the growth implications would be. And you have to build some consensus around that. Uh, and I think just... Uh, Doing it by diktat in the treasury is not is not going to take many tricks, I don't think. Uh, yeah. Are there any are there any periods of time where you think Bayes or its previous incarnations have actually worked well, and what do you think has contributed to that? Hmm. I, yeah, that's a bit of a struggle to think of a good. A good moment. Um, I mean, I, I I was sympathetic to the original um, construct of um, investment in 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 skills as being the kind of core of what they were trying to do, and that was actually under um, Vince Cable, really, although it was under the coalition government. Um, and I think they did some quite useful things on. 
you know, further education and skills training and, and, and an analysis of where our skill gaps were and how to fill them. So I think that was quite a useful exercise. Um, but they, unfortunately, they, they still frequently see themselves as a sponsor department for particular industries, which I think is not, is not helpful. Thank you. Um, I've got two parts to my question. The first is, what particular personality traits or skills make a good chancellor? Have you identified kind of particular skills that say chancellor after chancellor has been good, and that's because they got on with people, they had a fearsome intellect, whatever? And the second part of the question is, do you have a view on who's the best chancellor that we've never had? <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, if you talk to, you know, looking at the, the sort of 10 that I've looked at over the course of the, uh, the, the two books, I mean, interestingly, if you ask Treasury officials, they tend to admire uh, two things. They tend to admire um, a single-minded focus on, on a small number of achievable objectives is one thing because they think that can be achieved. And so, for example, they quite liked, you know, Gordon Brown's focus on child poverty in his second, the second Gordon Brown manifestation. Or uh, they liked Geoffrey Howe um, when he came in and had a very clear focus on sort of getting rid of exchange controls and sort of freeing up uh, bits of the financial economy. And, you know, it, it's not, it's, I don't think it's easy to argue that Geoffrey was the most wonderful Chancellor in all respects, and I doubt if Geoffrey would have had a great strategy, isn't <laughs> your question, as um, But he did achieve some clear things, and also, the second characteristic that they like um, is someone who is calm under fire, because the one thing you know is in the Treasury, uh, you know, you'll come in for a lot of, a lot of flack, and what you then want is somebody who, who kind of soaks it up uh, and is unflappable uh, and still just sort of presses on. And so on that score, Jeffrey again scores highly and Alistair Darling scored, scores highly with them because they, you know, the, the temptation to shoot the messenger is always strong and, you know, in the financial crisis, Treasury officials, well, yeah, we, we kept going in or the bank or the FSA would go into the charts and say, uh, here's another dead or dying financial institution and you know, rather than sort of lash about, he would say, oh dear, well, what are we going to do about that one then? Are we going to buy it? Are we going to close it? What are we going to do? You know, and just, uh, and that kind of calmness when, which gives you a sense that you can maintain momentum even when the headwinds are extremely strong is something which they, you know, w which they like. And so I think those two things, focus on some objectives that are achievable and not all over the place and where they eventually got fed up with Gordon was because he had, uh, you know, objectives all across government, which they couldn't achieve. I always remember the son of a friend of mine who said, told me, it was under late Gordon Brown, that he got a job in the Treasury. Oh, I said, oh, jolly good. Uh, and he said, you were then Treasury, weren't you? And, was, you know, he was 23 or something, he just came out of university. And uh, so I said, you know, what part of the Treasury are you going into? He said, oh, I'm going into immigration. <laughs> and, you know, there was a the immigration department. I mean, it was, you know, and that kind of thing. At that, that time, when Gordon was trying to be managing director of, you know, the whole country, that they lost, he lost them at that point because that, that's just no. As for the, the very good chancellor, that's a very good, very good question. I probably really need notice of that. Um, but, of course, the... Uh, you know, the one everybody thought would be great was Ian McLeod, who never, who only had a few months, a few months doing the job. Um, of the more, more recent people. Ed Balls. Well, yes, Ed Balls actually. That's probably true. Ed Balls would have been, uh, would have been a very good chancellor. Uh, Gordon thought of replacing Alistair Darling with him, but that wasn't a good time. But I think if they had won the 2010 election, Ed Balls would probably have been chanced. And he would have been good, I think. He would have been good. He has a clear view. It's never been a, a woman chancellor. No. Oh. That's interesting, isn't it? And it's uh, quite surprising, because I think it's the only... Uh, 
senior office of state in which uh, there's not been a woman. Um, was there a question at the back of the room? That was Thank you. You mentioned uh, the uh, base and DIT before and uh, non-achievements. So um, with regard to his records, how do you see uh, our new chancellor, uh, the prospects of being successful, achieving, and what would be uh, the conditions for him to really achieve, especially within the next two years? Yeah, well, I'm a bit reluctant to you know judge someone after a, a week uh, frankly um, but I think that it's a difficult uh, a difficult moment because I fear that the the seeds of recession have been sown um, I don't personally think it needs to be a very deep recession but I, I fear we are going to we are going to have a recession um, and we're also in a very delicate moment in the currency markets, I think, where you know the the markets sort of fallen out of love with sterling. Really, I mean, initially the story of this year was dollar strength rather than particular sterling weakness, but that seems to have turned around. And the you know there are quite a lot of people in the in the financial markets, not that they are the source of all wisdom, but you know, people saying, well, what we don't hear is, is any commitment to fiscal sustainability. And that's pretty hazardous, uh, I think. So I, I think that the challenge for him in the next couple of weeks is going to be pre to present something which clearly he's been told to do, you know, which looks like a growth strategy, but which does not uh, involve taking extreme risks with the public finances um, because you know we and the problem is that we are we're at a very high level of debt to GDP you know we're almost a hundred percent okay Italy is 180 but um, but because we've come off two uh, crises which bumped up public debt neither of which were his fault you know global financial crisis and COVID so now that's not that's not quasi Quartex's fault either of them, not, not in any way, but it's a baseline. The baseline is very high, and therefore, if interest rates rise and the cost of debt service goes up, and already it's gone up quite sharply because of index-linked debt, because you know about a quarter of the government's debt is index-linked, and uh, if anyone who's got an index-linked national savings certificate, as I have. I got one the other day. Unbelievable. You know, sort of 12% return I got in the last year. I mean, unfortunately, it was £1,000, but, you know. <laughs> uh, but it, still, still, nonetheless. It's 120 quid. Well, well, a round of tricks on you, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, I, and, you know, so I, I, I wonder, I haven't heard yet from him anything that suggests that he's aware of those constraints. And I think that's going to be the difficult task for him, to generate some momentum for the government whilst recognising uh, that his fiscal room for manoeuvre is not, I think, so great. Now, I may be wrong, but it doesn't look to me as though it's very great. Find out more on Friday. I just at the front. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks, Rem. Thanks very much. Um, Howard, very stimulating. Thoughts on the quality of Treasury officials over, over the years. When I did Cabinet, Government and the National Policy Process at the LSE 30-something years ago, um, the calculation used to be that one Treasury official was worth 10 in any other department. <laughs> any thoughts on the evolution of that uh, metrics? And does that go some way to explain perhaps why the Treasury is relatively effective and other departments like the Business Department are less effective? And I understand there was a change in recruitment policies 10 or 15 years ago and the access to the fast track and the uh, separate treasury recruitment. Has that had an impact in your perception in terms of the yeah. treasury officials? It's, um, it's a very, very interesting question and one which um, I pushed uh, my interviewees, particularly the senior officials, uh, quite hard on uh, to try to get their view. Um, now, the one thing... You can say is that you know, civil service pay uh, 
is relatively has fallen very sharply in uh, in recent years, um, and you know at some point it's got to make a difference, hasn't it? I mean, at some point it's got to make a difference. You know, there's some figures actually that John Kingman produced for a speech he made a couple of years ago, said that in 1970. Um, the, the, a middle grade civil treasury civil servant, like a grade seven equivalent at the moment, the salary of that person, um, at the, I think at the top of the scale of grade seven, was 1.2 times the average house price in London. Um, and so the average house price in London was 1.2 times, and, it, and the average house price in London is now 8.4 times the same grade of person. So that is a very, very significant devaluation, if you like, of the civil service. And it would be astonishing had that not reduced the quality to some degree. It would be astonishing. The market signals would not be working, would they, <laughs> if that were not the case. The Treasury has been able to protect itself from that to some degree by the fact that the Treasury tends to pluck people from other departments. If it gets into trouble... Uh, and it's short of people, it goes and, and most people in other departments will wish to go into the Treasury if they get the chance to, because they know that's, uh, you know, the sort of prestige. And of course, also, you can get out of the Treasury into well-paid jobs much more easily than if you're in the Department of Social Welfare. So, so the Treasury kind of conceals this problem to some degree by simply taking the best from the rest. Um, but... There are those who say, and Kingman would be one of them, that this process has now gone too far. He said to me, you know, the only very good people in the Treasury now are people who, whose other half is a corporate lawyer or an investment banker, and therefore they can afford to work in the Treasury. Now, it's one way of staffing a finance ministry, but it's a slightly odd one uh, to, to do it that way. But there are other people... Um, you know, Charles Roxburgh, who left recently, who said, look, you know, I, th I found it was possible to assemble really good teams in the COVID time to devise these schemes extremely quickly, and they were really, really smart people. It is possible still to do it. And there's actually quite a divide. I've got to say, I think to myself, there's got to come a point at which we have downgraded officials too far. That's got to be, got to be true. And I, what I fear is that you've got a very large amount of rotation of staff now. So a lot of people go in just for three or four years and then go out and make some money uh, elsewhere. Um, and that we are sort of creeping towards something more like the American system without ever having made a decision. Um, and that typically, you know, we used to have, it was just the minister and a couple of spads would come in and the rest of the, you know, the thing would say the same. In America, you know, they have secretaries, assistant secretaries, deputy assistant secretaries, etc. And, you know, a hundred or more people would come into the average ministry to, to run it. And they are people who have got well-paid jobs in the private sector. They know they're going to be there for four years, maximum eight. Um, and then they'll go back and make money and they bring in high-quality people. But we seem to be moving towards that without ever anyone ever having said that's what we're trying to do. So I think we need a proper discussion about what kind of public service we really want. Um, because if we keep on simply saying, well, we just have to have it cheaper, we have to have, you know, the people must be paid less and less and less, then I think at some point the system will break down. And indeed, I fear that in some departments it is already not great. It's not what it was. It really isn't. What do you make of the, the Singapore model of effectively paying you know, top, uh, I suppose, the execu private sector executive level salaries to some of the, the top civil servants to yes. try to attract, make, make it as something that you do as a vocation that's extremely highly paid? Um, I mean, there's a whole literature I remember studying and looking at saying, making a claim that civil servants aren't necessarily just attracted by money. You know, there's also a, a, a positive, greater, you know, intrinsic good or feeling or yes. nice sense they get out of it. But geez, you've got to 
pay a salary and uh, yeah, they have, a, food they on have the quite an artful system. I mean, uh, I, what I, I know about the regulators, for example, and they have a system whereby the head of the regulator is paid the average of a senior partner, but not the senior partner <laughs> in a law firm, um, a partner in an accounting firm. Uh, and a sort of manager, manager of a branch, of a not a branch, but of a sort of business line of a bank, and they take, they have these benchmarks, and then they average them, and they, that's that's the pay. I think that for the top end is quite uh, a good system. Whether you could operate in that in this country all the way through, I just you know, I mean, Singapore is kind of a company, not a country, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean, the Prime Minister very recently said that all the f- people should answer the phone after three rings, you know, and they all went, yeah, okay. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you can't really imagine that happening here. So I'm not sure Singapore would quite, but I do think that for the top jobs, you know, the really top jobs, I think that sort of benchmarking approach is quite, uh, is quite a good one, actually. So Singapore or Thames, but uh, perhaps just talking about in a Whitehall rather than everywhere else. Yeah. Um, there's a load more questions, so why don't we get back to it? Um, just the front there. I just wondered, um, talking of chancellors, uh, whether you had any comment on Anthony Barber and the relationship between him and now, and whether what he did then and what we're possibly going to see on Friday um, rings any worrying bells. Yes. Well, um, yeah, Philip, um, no, Chris Giles on the FT wrote a piece about this. I mean, uh, you know, Tony Barber even predates me, really. I mean, uh, you know, so I, uh, I guess that's right in the beginning of the of the seventies. But I do think there is a little bit of uh, a similarity, actually, the sort of Barber dash for growth, um, and the uh, sort of assumption was that you could quite quickly raise your growth rate, and that you would, you know, therefore get uh, benefit in the form of higher tax revenue to offset the tax cuts you'd implemented. Um, not many people believe that mechanism will work, not in the short time, not in the short term, I think. So I think it is a bit of a cautionary lesson. I thought Chris Charles made a good point. Martin Wolf also makes the same point in the yeah. FT today. Oh, in the FT today, yeah. Harold, uh, good to see you again. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about, ask a question relating to the use usefulness of an economics training. Um, in, 19, in the early 60s, I don't think there were any economists hired as economists uh, anywhere in the civil service, or certainly not in the Treasury. Um, that was the development in the 60s. Um, I remember Alec Douglas Hume. I don't think he was actually, he was prime minister briefly, but I don't think he'd been chancellor. But he, he I think, got a fourth in something or other in Oxford and used, used to say that he did economic calculations with a box of matches. Um, how, um, my, my specific question is, uh, what is the economics background of the 10 chancellors you've been talking about? Have they been trained in economics and has that been a, a help? Not, um, not many of them have. And in fact, I'm just trying to think, I mean, sort of going through Dennis Healy uh, certainly uh, wasn't. I mean, Geoffrey Howe would regard himself as sort of self-trained in economics, but he didn't have an economics degree, but he had spent a lot of time thinking about it before he took office. In fact, one of the interesting distinctions is whether people had an apprenticeship beforehand. And, and typically, we used to have a situation where people were shadow chances for quite a long time and during that period you know they the sensible ones and many of them were spent a lot of time with economic advisors reading economics books you know so they may not have had a formal economic training but if you look at say uh, Gordon um, or or indeed uh, uh, George Osborne um, they did they had long periods as shadow chancellor um, you know working doing a kind of apprenticeship economics apprenticeship, you might have said, as opposed to an economics degree, but probably not so bad. But, you know, Alistair Darling was a, uh, a lawyer. I mean, Kwarteng is an economic historian, uh, though not of anything very, very directly relevant to what we're doing. I'm just trying to think, I'm not sure there's been a, a professional economist in this period. 
I think I'm right. I think I'm right. So, so it's, hard to, um, it's hard to tell. Of course, the broader question of the role of economics in, uh, in policy making in the Treasury is, um, uh, is uh, interesting. Um, the, when I joined the Bank of England, Eddie George has often said, economics is the language of the Treasury, of the bank. Economics is the language of the bank. The Treasury would never say that quite, because it would say we are translating economics into politics and vice versa, if you like. And they wouldn't say that they were just doing a bit of economic analysis and then take it or leave it, you know? So I think in the Treasury, it's the juxtaposition of economics and politics that's important. And the people who were most successful are the ones who have a, a, an economic frame of reference, but who also understand the art of the possible. The bank has never, never thought that was part of its role. Uh, yes, the Hi there. I think the last two questions were honing in to where I want to go, which is, are we really, are we at the point where we're testing the economic and monetary policy of what we're studying? I mean, in a more cynical way, is it worth me going to the LSE and studying four years worth of monetary velocity and that sort of stuff? <laughs> or are we really <laughs> going on to unprecedented times and challenging these theories? Um, well, certainly um, a lot has changed and, um, you know, we now have people who believe in modern monetary economics and things like that. Uh, so, undoubtedly, um, you, would, you would find, you would not find that in your LSE course. I think. Are you um, sure? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but uh, actually, you would not find, um, I mean, I'm, you know, disappointingly, not that many professors at the LSE are very interested in British economic policy, actually. It's a truth, the truth of the matter is that they're not terribly. Um, and uh, they're physicists, really, and game theorists. Um, so, but then it's, you know, is that necessarily useless? No, I don't think it's useless. It's a, it's, a, it's a formation. It's an academic formation. But it isn't one that will cause you to come out with ready-made policies to run the economy. It, it's an, it's That's why we have the IEA, actually, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Bridging the gap. <laughs> yeah. So, I, so I, of course, I would never say that an eco economics degree was no, no use to you but I think it would be you know I, I think you you would find if you moved straight from an economics degree into the treasury as people do that suddenly you know it all looks very different once you get involved in policy making uh, is there another question yes um, yes you mentioned about Tolly's uh, expanding I mean how realistic is, is it for any chancellor to reform or simplify the tax code, whatever tax that is, personal, corporate or capital gains, inheritance tax, without the influence or, or the impact of um, Treasury to help them do that reform? Yes, well, it probably isn't. Um, I mean, I, I talked to some of the chancellors about this. And uh, in fact, there's a very good set of um, interviews um, which are published by the Institute of Government, actually, called, which I used, uh, because they kind of done their spade work really and I'm going to do it again um, which was called why is tax reform so difficult and they asked a lot of permanent secretaries and, and a lot of chancellors and some <laughs> chief secretaries and financial secretaries um, and essentially you know Alistair Darling said that you know the problem with it is that all the winners are stay, if you do a tax reform the winners stay silent and the losers uh, shout from the rooftops and therefore the only time you can do any serious tax reform is if you've got a bit of money spare to oil the wheels to essentially buy off the losers for a year or two and i guess the problem is that for quite a long time now we haven't done that i mean i think that gordon brown missed an opportunity in the early years of this century when you know if you remember we were almost in budget balance uh, for a while and um, you know that was a time when had he been bolder uh, 
and more interested in tax policy, which I don't think Gordon ever really was, actually. He was kind of interested in benefit policy, but he wasn't very interested in tax policy. Um, that, you know, spending um, a few billion on rationalising the tax system um, would have been, you know, quite worth doing and would have, would have helped us a lot. But one thing that one notices and is that some of the weirdnesses in our tax system have extremely deep roots in that, you know, the, probably the area of our tax system which is the most crazy is property taxation. And why is it the way it is? Well, I happen to have been involved in this because I was running the Audit Commission, which you didn't mention, uh, in the <laughs> late 80s. And it, I was running the Audit Commission, which at the time oversaw local authority spending. Right? At the time when uh, Mrs Thatcher introduced the uh, Communities Charge Stroke Poll Tax. And the problem with that was, uh, well, a, a, a per capita tax could never raise a huge amount of money. I mean, it just wasn't politically tolerable at other than quite a low level. You know, you could sell it at 150 quid or something, but you couldn't sell it at 500 quid. It's just impossible. Uh, so what happened was, there were, you know, poll tax was put introduced. The government had to replace the revenue uh, because it wasn't tolerable to have it at a level which generated the amount of local authority revenue that they had generated before through the rates. So eventually, you know, there were poll tax riots, a reform, Heseltine was put in to go and reform it and produced council tax, which was meant to be a stopgap solution for a couple of years. Uh, and I was around at the time, and vividly remember this, because it was a weird property tax which was capped in order to preserve political elements of the poll tax. Because it couldn't be a fully progressive tax, because it was meant to allow Margaret Thatcher to say, well, we've preserved elements, important elements of the community charge, you know, which were to do with getting people, everybody to feel they were paying some tax and therefore disciplining local authority spending, etc., etc. Uh, and, you know, it was then produced in this weird system where it, it stops at a very low level. And in London, you know, houses worth, whatever, 500,000, that's the maximum. And, you know, there are a few houses in London worth a little bit more than that. Um, and um, th so it's, cr it's crazy. Therefore, Osborne, um, because he needed more tax revenue, put it all on stamp duty. So now we have an unbelievable system where, you know, we have very little taxation on if you stay in your own house. But if you move, um, you pay through the nose. So someone like me, you know, we moved around in the 80s when we were having our children and stuff, and then we've sort of stuck. At in 1992, we bought our existing house. We had been massively undertaxed. And yet our children are paying through the nose because they bought a flat and then they bought a little house and then they bought a slightly bigger house. And their ta property taxation incidence is massive. And that, you know, but that rate is right back to the poll tax and responsibility of um, uh, Oliver Letwin and uh, William Waldgrove. <laughs> They're the guilty men. They, uh, well, we know we know who, who to blame for everything. Um, well, on, on that note, perhaps uh, a little bit too pessimistic, but I think a, a quite fascinating and engaging and interesting discussion. Thank you so much. I just wanted to conclude by thanking the IA Book Club members as well as the IA donors who've joined us here tonight. For those who'd like to join the IA Book Club, if you'd like to receive invitations, uh, to these events as well as priority access um, to our books and a chance to interact with the IEA and leading authors, please do visit the IEA website or you can speak to my colleague Alex who's standing at the back of the room together, uh, back of the room and, and put together today's event and did a fantastic job doing so. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.